Well, good morning, Southside. We had a sweet time of worship looking at our holy God and one song is from Isaiah 6 and the holy prophet gets a glimpse of God's holiness and the angels are saying, holy, 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 it's the Lord God of hosts. And Isaiah's undone and I'm a man, I'm ruined, I'm unraveling as I look at this holy God. And then uh, the angels come and stick those tongs and pull out this coal and remove his iniquity. And it's a picture of the atonement, same Hebrew word there, and the Septuagint. And so uh, there's a way to stand in his presence blameless with great joy, the presence we just sang about. So the reason we gather is I can stand blameless before that God by the work of Jesus Christ and be loved and not consumed. So we, we gather to worship because of that great reality. Well, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 11, we're currently studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans, if you're visiting. And this morning, we're going to look at a verse that has had a long history of debate throughout the church. And so it's going to be kind of a, a technical morning. So I ask that you labor with me because it's going to give birth to something really sweet. Some of you love this. Some of you are ready for your nap. Uh, love truth. Wrestle with it. Understand it. Come Come worship in the Word of God with me here this morning. So let's pray for God's blessing and leading as we look at Romans eleven twenty five. Father, we come before you and I thank you that what we hold in our hands this morning is the Word of God. And it's perfect. It's been inspired by your Holy Spirit. It's God-breathed. It's profitable for correction, reproof, training in righteousness. And I pray by your Spirit that you would use it mightily in our hearts this morning that it would produce worship and repentance and joy in this glorious gospel that we've been studying in Romans. And so, Father, meet us, guide your servant. Lord, let me walk your path uh, in truth this morning. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we've been looking at Romans 11.1, 1, has God rejected the Jews is the question and in verses 1 through 10, Paul showed us that there's been a portion of Israel that has been saved, this remnant by sovereign grace. And then in verses 11 through 24, he's been showing us what's the purpose of Israel's rejection of their Messiah. And we saw that it's bringing in the fullness of the Gentiles from all the nations into this gospel. And some have called this section, God's plan complete, the fullness of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Israelites uh, faith in Jesus Christ. So this is the culmination this morning of Romans 9 through 11. <clears throat> Romans 9, 6 says, has God's purposes failed in history with Israel? If he can't hold them, how can he hold us, the people of God under the new covenant? And Paul has shown that God is still in control of history. This is his story. He's unfolding it perfectly. And so the rejection of Israel is the conversion of the Gentiles all according to the wise, perfect plan of God. And his goal in verse 32, to show mercy to the nations, to all Jew and Gentile, so that all the glory will go to God. <laughs> Praise be to God for his great salvation. And that should be the response of this section that we will see in two weeks. I'm jealous for the glory of God, and that is what Paul is laboring for in this section. And so this is what I've been praying for and preaching, and that you should be taken up with him and not get lost in every nuance of details, uh, to, to stay, not stay on earth, but get lost in heaven. And Paul last week told us we should approach all of this with great humility. To make little of ourselves and to make much of God is where this gospel should lead us. This morning, we're going to try and tackle verse 25. Let me read it. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So this is probably the punchline for Paul, verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. And so, however, it's not surprising that the history of this verse has sometimes not been edifying. We, we have had some de heated debates throughout centuries over this passage. 1126a has been a theological battleground. And so my calling this morning is to take the Hatfields, 
the amillennialists and the McCoys, the premillennialists, and bring us together in Christ. You could pray for me. The Hatfields and the McCoys are easy. So what God did with the Gentiles and the Jews is the enmity has been taken away, and He said, I've, I've made one new man in Ephesians 2. And so we, we've come into one in Jesus Christ. The, the dividing wall has been broken, the separation into one new man in Jesus Christ. So if God can do that, He can take brothers and sisters in Christ and let them live in unity and in harmony with a difference on Romans eleven twenty six and not question each other's integrity or salvation if they hold a different interpretation of thus all Israel will be saved. So before we start this morning's message, I'm going to do something a little out of the ordinary. Uh, I hope it's out of the ordinary. I want to set the context. Uh, we do that every week, but not the biblical context of Romans. I, I like setting the biblical context, but I want to set for you the context of Southside Bible Church. We started 24 years ago in October. I was a graduate of the Master's Seminary, and I was this glowing, dispensational, premillennialist, pre-trib rapture guy, ready to set everyone straight and on fire. And we, we took Grace Community's doctrinal statement from where I went to school, and we've modified it as we've journeyed. Well, in that journey, some of our elders have landed on a different conviction on this subject. And we prayed long and hard as a church, and we discussed it uh, to ad nauseum. What do we do with this? Do we start two churches, four churches? Where do we go uh, with these differences? And the question was, is it possible to stay together as one church and function in unity on the essentials of what we said was justification, sanctification, and glorification, and have a doctrinal statement that would hold us as a church and teachers would say, this is what we teach as a church, and they'd be able to share, here's another view is such and such. And the doctrinal statement at Southside says this about last things. Southside Bible Church fundamentally holds to a premillennial eschatological position. However, we do not believe that one's personal eschatological views concerning things like the timing of the rapture or the nature of the millennium <clears throat> should be a cause for division in the body of Christ. Members of Southside hold to different positions in these areas. Yet because of a common love for Christ and His gospel, we love one another and serve together in the church's high calling to advance the kingdom of God as we wait for His glorious return. And so we believe, as an elder board, that it would be more beneficial to labor in these truths and to stretch each other in good, healthy debate and discussion to deepen our own understanding and convictions in these areas. Would God be more glorified in our unity and in justification, sanctification, and glorification? If you're visiting, that is how you get right with God by faith, how He grows you in His holiness, and how He brings you to heaven and perfectly glorifies you. To, to, would we be unified in that with differences on what we would call from the Reformation, non-essential. So are these truths important? You better believe it. Uh, is it heresy, the other views with an all-millennial view? Uh, we would say absolutely not. And so usually where you go on this, you have people where churches will say doctrine's not important. Uh, all that matters is what you do. And our hearts is doctrine is very important and we labor in it and we teach it and preach it. But we believe that there are some non-essential things that the body of Christ does not divide over. Uh, what I've watched in America, at least in my short little life, I guess my long life, is a splintered, divided up church as we sit here this morning. With every nuance of difference, we start another church or a denomination. Uh, cultural differences will start up new churches. Uh, if you drive, I said this before, if you drive around the South, the, the names of the churches even tell you what the splits were over. This is the Free Will Baptist Church. I wonder what they split over. <clears throat> There's a lack of oneness in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're dividing up over non-essentials on every turn. And as America's getting more and more gnarly, so are the people in the church. And this is our time to shine with forbearance and love and grace. And, and they're starting to dig in the trenches even more. And I think it's done much harm to the power and the unity of the church to show the oneness with those who believe this gospel 
and believe in a growing holiness and believe that Jesus is coming back. And when we start putting that on display, I think you're going to have more and more people say, what's the hope of the gospel? Versus dividing up and arguing and fighting on non-essentials. I'll die for the essentials. I, I, I love this church. You guys would die for the gospel. And that's a beautiful thing. So we determined to labor together with our differences and lock shields on these essentials, to lead people to Christ by this amazing gospel, to see them grow and deepen in it, and become like Christ and take their last breath, trusting in faith and see Jesus face to face with eternal life with him. My, my favorite moments are watching saints enter into glory. And, and I have watched every saint in this church pass with faith in Jesus Christ and entered into his presence forever. And so my heart says, this is going to work. <laughs> I've watched it for 24 years and I've seen amazing things. And I've watched gnarly, convicted Calvinists grow in having a love for a brother who differs on the rapture. <laughs> and I've watched you sit shoulder to shoulder and take communion with a different view on the millennium. And I just smile. So that's beautiful that you're holding that bread saying this is what unifies us and holds us together as one. To show the world the unity of Ephesians 4 and what unifies us and puts the manifold wisdom of God on display is beautiful. And so it's a call last week for humility. We seek to know God deeper and deeper in his word and dwell together in charity on those differences. And that's what we're about here at Southside Bible Church. So we've had parking lot issues and I thought I would just clear them out. If anyone, if you want just the church that holds to one view or the other, come see me. I'll, I know a lot of good ones on both sides and that's all they teach. They teach where Israel and their future are essential, um, and I, I can guide you. And I know there are some here this morning who care too little about this, and there are some who care too much about this, and you've lacked love in your dealings with other people. And so my call is that we journey together into this passage and find again what should unify us um, in Jesus Christ, and I, I pray that we keep growing in these beautiful things together. Any questions? <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the unity in Jesus Christ. I thank you that I sit with brothers and sisters this morning who have found Jesus Christ to be their all and all. They look to him and they believe in him and they seek to follow him, to have his complete control over their lives to take his commission and go after it. God, I thank you for that. And I pray that it would keep us strong hand in hand until we breathe our last. I pray that it would sanctify us more as we have to discuss and give grace and learn more of other views versus straw men and that rubbing shoulders and, 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 and just the differences are what caused a reformation, God. Would you continue to cause that? in our own hearts. And so pour out your spirit, Lord. This is a harder path to walk, and we need you to keep us in unity and in humility and in love and having you as the center of everything, that we are more committed to you and your glory than our own system. God, I pray that that would be the end goal of every heart sitting here this morning that knows Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, verse 25. For I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. So Paul starts with brethren, the church as a whole. It's always to express his tender affection to the brothers and sisters in Christ. He's a, a pastor. He has a true heart in sharing this. He wanted his readers to understand God's purpose and ways of bringing salvation into this world. And he tells us it's a mysterion. It's a, a mystery. And the mystery in the, in the Greek does not mean Sherlock Holmes or Columbo or who done it. A mystery are they, they're matters of fact that are inaccessible to reason. They, they can only be known by revelation, by God revealing them. And simply put, they are hidden until God reveals it. As we close out Romans, I want to read to you verse 25 of chapter 16. Now to him who's able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, 
according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever, amen. Paul says in Ephesians 3.1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me a mystery, the mystery, and as I wrote before in brief, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. It's been revealed to me, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, what is that mystery, Paul? That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. <clears throat> so Israel's future is a mystery. None of us could figure it out by deduction or reasoning. As far as we can see, Israel's been rejected because they rejected their Messiah. And God's revealed it to Paul, and now Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is making it known. And he doesn't want you to be uninformed. He says, lest you be wise in your own estimation, lest you think you are in and the Jews are out because of your superior understanding, better raw material. You're just arrogant that we saw last week, cocky, and this whole thing is to humble you at the feet of Christ. And so I'm going to instruct you with what God has revealed he's going to do with Israel. And Paul says it's a mystery that was revealed to himself. Paul didn't get this on his own. <clears throat> so what is this mystery, Paul? Well, he tells us in verse 25, if you'll look with me, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, what? That a partial hardening has happened to Israel. The word hardening is an insensibility, a hardness. It leads to blindness. We looked at it last week. Uh, it, let me just read to you. It's Romans 9, 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. This hardness, this hardening. And we saw it in Romans 11, 7 through 10, this, the, the Greek word was calcification. The, the heart is calcified in the hardness of Israel. And so the problem with them is this blindness, this hardness, this unbelief. And that is why Romans 10, Paul said they rejected the Messiah when he came. They're, they're hard to truth. They're hard to the gospel. They're hard to Christ. It made no impact on them. It just made them angry. And so get this. This is, this is not the mystery this is part of the mystery. He's laying it out for us that there was a partial hardening that's happened to Israel. The word partial, uh, it's not to the degree of hardening. Uh, it, it's, it's rather that, they were, that, that not all were hardened. It was a remnant, a, a bulk uh, have been hardened. Lloyd-Jones believes it's the duration of the hardening. So that, that there's been this partial hardening for the duration. Uh, the, not all of Israel, but majority of them have been hardened. And it's happened to Israel. And there's this key word that Greg was talking about this morning in verse 25. And this is what has really led me to my, what my, probably the biggest reason to my conclusion is that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So I, I would anticipate uh, the other view that it's just the elect and the remnants coming in of Jew and Gentile. It'd be while the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So this word is it's very interesting until. And it's, it's probably, I think, the, the key in understanding what he's saying. So first, let's look at the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Uh, this has been the ingathering of all the world into Jesus Christ. 11, 16 through 24 is the Gentiles have been engrafted into that rich root of the promise made to Abraham and faith in the seed that would come, Jesus Christ. No one gets into this tree of salvation without faith. You were cut off for your unbelief. You're grafted in by your faith. And so the question before I look at the until is what is the fullness of the Gentiles then? What's that? Well, that is that God has decreed 
to bring Gentiles from all the world, from all times, into the salvation that he's procured in his son. And so I want you to catch this Gentiles. It's mostly Gentiles here this morning. I love all how many nations are represented here. Uh, my friends, we're in that word. Every believer in here, Gentile, the fullness of the Gentiles, Ken Murphy's in that term, fullness. I, I've been brought in to the rich promise that was made to Abraham. And this is the same word in verse 12 of chapter 11. How much more will their fulfillment be, the pleroma? It has two meanings. It can mean qualitative or quantitative. And here it's quantitative. And it's in the number of elect Gentiles. It's showing you there's a full number. God has his, his elect, and he's chosen them throughout the eternity past we saw when we studied that. In this present age, there's a determined number of Gentile believers, and they're to be engathered, and they're to be uh, grafted into the rich olive tree, and that's why missions exist, is to take this gospel to the world, and God's promising, I've got elect all over the world, and when they hear it, the, his ones are believing, and they're being grafted into this rich history in our Bibles of what God has done. And so Romans 8, 29 through 30, whom he foreknew, he called and justified and he will glorify. God will lose none. <laughs> so that, that is the two things being joined together by this word until. There's a partial hardening of the Jews that we've looked at until there's a fullness of the Gentiles that are brought in. And that's the season we live in now, the ingathering of the nations. And the until connects them together. And so until has two main meanings as I was studying this. The one is the hardening of the Jew until the point of Gentile fulfillment. In our text, so what they would say is that it's just until all the Gentiles, the elect Gentiles, are brought in. And our text doesn't say anything after that. And I concede that no matter what your view is, <clears throat> Paul does not say there's a partial hardening of Israel and then it will be removed. He doesn't say it that way. But he says a hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And what is more, un until can be used in, the, in that way. If someone said to me, I'm going to love you until I die, that does not say what happens after I die. Just how long is it going to happen? I'm going to love you until I die. It will go all the way up to that point. It doesn't say what happens after I die. So the argument is that all this is saying is this hardening will happen while the ingathering of the Gentiles is taking place. And it never says the hardening of the nation is removed. It never says what comes after that just until that time. The fullness of the Gentiles, the hardening will be on of the Jews while that happens, with a remnant being called out by God like Paul was. And I have some very dear brothers in this church that hold to that, and some great scholars who hold to that as well. It is not heresy. You won't lose your salvation if you hold to that view. I hope you're understanding what the view is. So the view is just... In gather, hardening Jews, in gathering Gentiles, and when they all come in, uh, then, then we're finished. And so that's what Paul's dealing with. There's another way to understand until, and this is where I personally would land. <clears throat> and I'm going to say that this is the most common way to understand this word until. It means that the, there will be a change. It's used 43 times in the New Testament, and 37 times it means that. Um, I didn't look up each one. I took that from a commentator. It doesn't mean it can't be the other, but that's big. And the context is what's driving me so hard to this conclusion. That at this point, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and there is a difference from that point out until. And so what the context has said again and again, it said Israel's failure, what will their fulfillment be? And it's this greater argument. It's what's going to happen when they get their fulfillment? If, if their rejection ha has brought all this of Gentiles coming in, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He just keeps showing this big thing that's coming. It just keeps showing that this will move to a new condition with Israel. The hardening will continue and it will have an end. It will be lifted. There will be a change until 
Change is coming until then. Fullness of the Gentiles until that point. The hardening's gonna be lifted from Israel. And this, there will be this glorious turning point with the Jews. And the historical marker will be the fullness of the Gentiles being brought into the covenant of promise. And so that is the common usage of the word <coughs> until. Greg read in Luke 21, 24, talking about Israel, they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So there's the until again. And, and so there's something coming when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And the context, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans was 70 AD. And in Jerusalem, the, the Gentile hands uh, until the end with the Jews. And what is amazing to me is for some 1900 years, uh, the Gentiles controlled Jerusalem. And in 1967, this hasn't ever happened. The, the nation is brought back together and they've come strolling back into Israel. So it's pretty amazing. Maybe the Gentile age is coming to an end. And so we, we might be right in these eschatological end days. That's my prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. But what needs to end before this can happen is that the fullness of the Gentiles are brought in. So we all agree on that piece, that the Gentiles are being brought in. And so there's a day in history <coughs> when this decree of hardening that God has put on Israel will be lifted. And the mystery is not the hardening of Israel, but the lifting of the hardening is the mystery. And so the mystery is not the fullness of the Gentiles, that's been promised through the, through the Old Testament, but the connection to ethnic Israel over whom Paul has been weeping, saying, I wish I could be damned that they could be saved. Any questions? Okay, then let's keep going. Verse 26. I appreciate you, if that was monotonous, it gets worse in verse 26. So just please labor with me for the beauty of what will come. In verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. John Murray says that it joins the previous data and conclusion accordingly. So there's two ways that this can be taken. There's many ways, but these are the two main views that I see today. Two ways, all Israel will be saved. It's taken as a temporal time sense. And it's like a sequence. The Jews were hard, all the Gentiles have been brought in, and thus all Israel will be saved. The word and thus speaks of the manner, not a time frame. The ESV says, and in this way. This is the manner in which all Israel will be saved. And so the question is, in what way? And that's where some difference will come in, but in what way? And it is in this manner of Romans 11, 11 through 24. In what manner? The hardening of the Jews. We make them jealous. Gentiles are brought in. That's how it's going to happen in that manner. And this process that Paul's been explaining through chapter 11, this is the amazing way that the blessing is going to come to the world is through Jewish hardening. And Israelite salvation coming through Gentile salvation at the end. This is the part of the mystery that's being revealed. It, it's, it's truly an inversion. The gospel goes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, and now it's going to the Gentile first and then to the Jew. It's inverted. It's not the anticipated process. That's the mystery that's being revealed. And now for the debate is all Israel will be saved. Four major interpretations on all Israel will be saved. Aren't you glad you got up and came here this morning? I see the eye of the tiger in that brother. He's like, yeah, that's good. Because everyone else was like, okay. All Israel. This is important. Could be all Israel is all the elect. It's gonna, you're going to Jewish hardening, Gentiles come in, and you get all the Jews, all the Gentiles, and you're calling it Israel, and all Israel will be saved when all the elect are brought in. John Calvin, Martin Luther, Augustine, Hold to this view. Um, those are some mighty, mighty men right there if you just throw that off like they're idiots. Those are some great scholars right there, and we, we owe respect to those men. Secondly, it's the total number of elect Jews. 
So it's, it's not so much the Gentiles, it's just throughout history, all this remnant Jew that's been believing, uh, when they finally all come, all Israel will be saved. And this is Lenski and Bavink hold to that view. Paul said he was elect, 7,000 the days of Elijah that didn't bow their knees. <laughs> There's been numbers of Jews saved each decade, and it will just go to the end. And so all Israel will be saved and all the Jews throughout the centuries. Third view is that every individual Jew will be saved. Anyone throughout all of history with kosher genes will be saved. And I will just step out on a limb and say that's the only one that's heresy. That, that, is, a, that is a heretical view. Uh, we've already saw that they've been hardened. They've died in unbelief throughout history. You die in unbelief, you go to hell. And so this view that anyone who's ever had a kosher gene is going to all be saved, uh, that one we must and will reject. And then the fourth view is the nation of Israel as a whole at that time is going to be turning to Jesus Christ in faith. Not assuming every individual will be saved, but the nation at large will be converted. And Paul says it's like life from the dead. Life from the dead with this nation who's been dead for so many centuries. And so I, th I think number three is heresy. <clears throat> I can have sweet fellowship with anyone who holds to one, two, or four, but I choose door number four. That doesn't mean squat. That just means your pastor thinks door number, one of your pastors thinks door number four is right. Uh, some of your other pastors think door number one is right. Murray says, how anticlimactic in this context would be the general truth implicit in all of Paul's teaching that all the elect will be saved. It's the salvation of the mass of Israel that the apostle affirms. John Murray says that. So I'm going to give you five reasons why I think it's door number four. And I'm borrowing a lot of my thoughts from a couple different scholars, but John Piper was one of the main ones. If you'll look with me in Romans 11, 25 and 26. Verse 25, there's been this hardening uh, for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. In verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. And so verse 25 and 26 are referring to the same thing. There's nothing telling us they contrast. So we have the hardening upon Israel in verse 25. And who is that? That's the whole nation as a whole. We're all in agreement on that. that that's the hardening upon them. And in verse 26, the meaning should be the exact same. The hardened Israel is now the saved Israel. He's showing the, the connection in 25 and 26, the until. Second reason he's going to talk about it in next week, that he's going to drive out ungodliness from Jacob representing the nation. And so this whole nation, there's going to be driving out the iniquity of it, removing it. And that's where I just keep seeing this whole nation believing at the end, because all their iniquity is going to be removed in the gospel of Jesus Christ at the end. <clears throat> Look at verse 28, two parallels. From the standpoint of the gospel, they, that's the whole, the hardened nation of Israel, they're enemies for your sake, so that you can come to Jesus Christ, Gentiles. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, and it's the same they. So the, the, the Israel, the nation, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers, the hardened nation. And so we see the, the, they got to be kept parallel. Come back to verse 12. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world, the hardened Jews, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Their, their trespass has brought hardening and riches to the world. It's brought in all the Gentiles. If their failure, and their failure is the corporate nation, their failure is... Uh, how much more will their fulfillment be? The corporate nation. They, they just stay parallel. And it's just so consistent all the way through verse 15. <clears throat> For if their rejection, the nation of Israel, is the reconciliation of the world, the Gentiles, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So climactic. Their rejection was a corporate nation. What will their acceptance be as a corporate nation that's hardened. And so it is evident that Paul meant to say that the Jews were to be restored in the sense in which they were rejected. The whole nation hardened and the whole nation 
being brought to Jesus Christ and believing. Paul is speaking of the rejection of the Jews as a nation, not individuals, Jews and Gentiles. He's dealing with nations. And Paul was looking to a general conversion of the, entire, of the ethnic body called the nation of Israel. A few verses that I think are talking about this. Zechariah 12.10, God says, I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Isaiah 66, 8, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. And then Matthew 23, that gray grid, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Total depravity. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you shall not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So it's already been Palm Sunday when that was written. They were yelling, crucify him. There's this great hardness. And he says, you're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's what I see happening here in Romans 11 with that nation when they cry out and they worship and they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So my conclusion, someone's shoe phone is ringing. So my conclusion is all Israel will be saved. And it will be the whole nation following the fullness of the Gentiles being brought in to this gospel. The hardening decree is going to be lifted and Israel will call upon the name of Yeshua, Jesus, and they'll be saved. And as widespread as its unbelief is right now will be as widespread as its belief will be then. To God be the glory for the way he works in history. And so I'm inclined to that interpretation. It's a nation, not a small remnant, through history marked by faith in its Messiah. I just That life from the dead uh, just is so powerful to me. And I'm cool with anyone else who takes those other views, one or two. And I have much love for you. We have discussed this and prayed and debated and reasoned. Uh, and again, that brings Reformation kind of stuff. It just keeps growing me. Uh, it brings humility and unity and love when we dwell together in these kind of differences. And I, and I don't know why we, we make these issues um, salvific and we divide up the body of Christ and we devour people and we leave them in our paths. I'll never understand that when the, the meek and humble Jesus Christ has come and revealed how we deal with one another uh, in these ways. May all men know we're Christians by our love. And so my question is, what should we do? Pray. Romans 10, 1, pray for Israel's conversion. Romans 10, how are they going to hear without a preacher? Keep preaching this gospel everywhere and anywhere. Romans 11, 14, let's go make them jealous by showing the beauty and the sweetness of what happens when you know Christ and what he does in your life. He doesn't make you mean, gnarly, and nasty. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance, and you'll start manifesting that, and people will start asking you, what is the hope within you? No pride, fear, a reverence for God who pulls out a divine chainsaw and cuts off dead branches for their unbelief, and humility. And may we all have doxology as we look at a God who's ordered history this way so that everyone is shut up in disobedience and we'll all worship God who has done all of this in Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever, all the nations praising him for what he has done in Jesus Christ. What that should do to your heart is big. Some of you have led people to your view on Israel but have you led anyone to Jesus Christ? 
What really is the preoccupation of your life? And I pray that it's this glorious Christ. And we join our hands together to lift up the name above every name. And so in closing, if you've come here this morning and you're visiting or you've been coming for a while and your life maybe is just broken and fallen apart and you're hurting and you're struggling and you're like, I got up early to come here that. I want you to see the beauty is that there's a God who's over all of history and he's working and he's hardening and he's taking gospels to the nation because he wants to show mercy to all peoples. And the way mercy is shown is he put his own son up on a cross in time and in space in this world. And there he punished him. He, he pulled out his sword of justice for our sins and he pierced his own son through for three hours on a cross. Jesus drained the whole wrath of God that was deserving of us for our sins so that now God can say, you're forgiven. I gave my son justice, so now I can give you mercy this morning for all of your sins. And so if you're sitting here feeling like your life is out of control, here's this perfect sovereign God working every detail and your little life, he's working the same way. And I want you to see that there is forgiveness in Christ Jesus and there's adoption so that you become a son or a daughter of God. And now you have this sovereign God as your father working everything in your life for good to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. And so that is the beauty of what we're laboring and looking at is a God that we can trust, who keeps his promises. You can die on it. That's what he's been showing. He keeps his promises, and he's a saving God for all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are here this morning and you um, need to be saved, you need to know this God, uh, I'm going to be standing up here afterwards with some other elders, and I'm going to ask that you come forward and we'll guide you and help you uh, to understand this and in a, in a new life to live for Jesus Christ. So I pray today that you might say, I got saved in Romans 11.25. You might be the only person in the world. Um, I had someone last week say that, and I was like, no way. Uh, cutting off divine branch, branches and stuff, all right. So maybe, maybe even this morning as you look at this, you can see there's a God who's controlling your life specifically and detailed. And he's a saving God for all who come to Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this gospel. I thank you for how intricate the way you chose to save the nations, to save uh, the Jewish nation that you called out in Abraham and said, I'll bless through this seed that will come from Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that Gentiles now get a call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be brought near to be grafted into that promise. God, we thank you for this amazing gift. I pray, let us go make people jealous by how sweet this gospel is, to know the creator, the living God, in days that are falling apart. Lord, let us be that city set on a hill and just shine a saving God and his beauty and his power. Lord, please work in us and let them be jealous that, that they might come to Jesus Christ. And we look forward to that day. Lord, when this hardening will be lifted and, and a whole nation that has been rejecting the, the very Messiah that has been promised to them thousands of years ago, that they would fall and believe and be saved. God, I thank you for such a glorious plan. And it's in Christ Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen.